these things are heavy. Laptops. Trying to hold this up the whole time. Might be a better angle, but. No. Um, hey, check out this look. It's kind of fresh. Not tying it. Just throwing it on. I will say I, <clears throat> I was down doing laundry and I just pulled these shorts off of like the, is it clean? Is it dirty? Okay. It's not clean, but you know, so I put these shorts on and there wasn't a top downstairs. And since I, my curtain rods broke this morning, I had to, uh, I'm, I'm like, so anyways, I put this on for modesty and I was walking upstairs and it reminded me of my, my younger days when I used to wear tops that were just, that were just like this, like all the way down. <laughs> it was a look. It was, it, it was a lot of skin. I remember when I first started showing like chest, but not boobs, just like, like right here, like breast bone. And I felt so naked. Now I just feel naked if my, you know, nipples are showing, <laughs> but <clears throat> look, I have long hair again. So far this morning, I woke up like this. <gasps> okay. So that's how I woke up. That is the first breath I took this morning. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it took me about an hour to get back off that ledge there. Uh, I was going out to take the trash out in the dark. It was dark at like 6 a.m. still. Oh, Sunday, January 7th, 2024 at 942 a.m. Three, four hours ago, I got up. I was doing all my chores, taking the trash out, vacuuming. Had to vacuum again when I got back in from taking the trash out. And, you know, like put down a new rug and then like immediately went outside and had to like track everywhere. It's just very tedious, annoying things. Um, but dusting and laundry, going through it, going through it. Uh, anyways, I've changed clothes like three times and Oh my gosh, this is the redundancies that I have to deal with. It's almost, it's like silly because I, I send out links for things so often and nobody ever responds. And then the one time I'm like, okay, they're actually going to join because I've sent links out hundreds of times. How do I join? <clears throat> you need a, you need a, a link. Let's see, was it share? I got one right here. Let me just uh, copy that for you right quick. Um, here we go. Here's a link. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> Perf. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyways, on to chapter nine. Good morning. This chapter is titled 
at the masked ball. And it is, let's see. <clears throat> what was that, 13? Thirteen clicks. So let's do this. The envelope was covered with mud and unstamped. It bore the words to be handed to M. Le Vicomte Raoul de Chani with the address in pencil. It must have been flung out in the hope that a passerby would pick up the note and deliver it, which was what happened. The note had been picked up on the pavement of the Place de l'Opera. Raoul read it over again with fevered eyes. No more was needed to revive his hope. The somber picture, which he had for a moment imagined of a Christine forgetting her duty to herself, made way for his original conception of an unfortunate, innocent child, the victim of imprudence and exaggerated sensibility. To what extent at this time was she really a victim? Whose prisoner was she? Into what whirlpool had she been dragged? He asked himself these questions with a cruel anguish. But even this pain seemed endurable beside the frenzy into which he was thrown at the thought of a lying and deceitful Christine. What had happened? What influence had she undergone? What monster had carried her off? And by what means? By what means indeed, but that of music. He knew Christine's story. After her father's death, she acquired a distaste of everything in life, including her art. She went through the conservatoire like a poor, soulless singing machine. And suddenly she awoke as though through the intervention of a god, the angel of music appeared upon the scene. She sang Margarita in Faust and triumphed. The angel of music, for three months, the angel of music had been giving Christine lessons. Oh, he was a punctual singing master. And now he was taking her for drives in the boy. Raoul's fingers clutched at his flesh above his jealous heart. In his inexperience, he now asked himself with terror what game the girl was playing. Up to what point could an opera singer make a fool of a good-natured young man, quite new to love? Oh, misery. Thus did Raoul's thoughts fly from one extreme to the other. He no longer knew whether to pity Christine or to curse her, and he pitied and cursed her turn and turn about. At all events, he bought a white domino. The hour of the appointment came at last, with his face in a mask trimmed with long, thick lace, looking like a Pierrot in his white wrap. The Viscount thought himself very ridiculous. Men of the world do not go to the opera ball in fancy dress. It was absurd. One thought, however, consoled the Viscount. He would certainly never be recognized. This ball was an exceptional affair, given some time before Shrovetide in honor of the anniversary of the birth of a famous draftsman. And it was expected to be much gayer, noisier, more bohemian than the ordinary masked ball. Numbers of artists had arranged to go, accompanied by a whole cohort of models and pupils who, by midnight, began to create a tremendous din. Raoul climbed the grand staircase at five minutes to twelve, did not linger to look at the motley dresses displayed all the way up the marble steps. One of the richest settings in the world allowed no facetious mask to draw him into a war of wits replied to no jests and shook off the bold familiarity of a number of couples who had already become a trifle too gay. Crossing the big crush room and escaping from a mad whirl of dancers in which he was caught for a moment, he at last entered the room mentioned in Christine's letter. He found it crammed for this small space was the point where all those who were going to suffer in the rotunda crossed those who were returning from taking a glass of champagne. The fun here waxed fast and furious. Raoul leaned against a doorpost and waited. He did not wait long. A black domino passed and gave a quick squeeze to the tips of his fingers. He understood that it was she and followed her. 
Is that you, Christine? He asked between his teeth. The black domino turned round promptly and raised her finger to her lips, no doubt to warn him not to mention her name again. Raul continued to follow her in silence. He was afraid of losing her after meeting her again in such strange circumstances. His grudge against her was gone. He no longer doubted that she had nothing to reproach herself with, however peculiar and inexplicable her conduct might seem. He was ready to make any display of clemency, forgiveness, or cowardice. He was in love, and no doubt he would soon receive a very natural explanation of her curious absence. The black domino turned back from time to time to see if the white domino was still following. As Raul once more passed through the great crush room, this time in the wake of his guide, he could not help noticing a group crowding around a person whose disguise, eccentric air, and gruesome appearance were causing a sensation. It was a man dressed all in scarlet with a huge hat and feathers on the top of a wonderful death's head. From his shoulders hung an immense red velvet cloak, which trailed along the floor like a king's train. And on this cloak was embroidered in gold letters, which everyone read and repeated aloud. Don't touch me. I am Red Death stalking abroad. Then one greatly daring did try to touch him, but a skeleton hand shot out of a crimson sleeve and violently seized the rash one's wrist. And he feeling the clutch of the knuckle bones, the furious gasp of death, uttered a cry of pain and terror. When Red Death released him at last, he ran away like a very madman, pursued by the jeers of the bystanders. It was at this moment when Raoul passed in front of the funeral masquerader, who had just happened to turn in his direction, and he nearly exclaimed, the death's head of Paras Gorek. He had recognized him. He wanted to dart forward, forgetting Christine, but the black domino, who also seemed a prey to some strange excitement, caught him by the arm and dragged him from the crush room, far from the mad crowd through which Red Death was stalking. The black domino kept on turning back and apparently on two occasions saw something that startled her, for she hurried her pace in Raoul's as though they were being pursued. They went up two floors. Here, the stairs and corridors were almost deserted. The black domino opened the door of a private box and beckoned to the white domino to follow her. Then Christine, whom he recognized by the sound of her voice, closed the door behind them and warned him in a whisper to remain at the back of the box and on no account to show himself. Raoul took off his mask. Christine kept hers on. And when Raoul was about to ask her to remove it, he was surprised to see her put her ear to the partition and listen eagerly for a sound outside. Then she opened the door ajar, looked out into the corridor, and in a low voice said, He must have gone up higher. Suddenly she exclaimed, He is coming down again. She tried to close the door, but Raoul prevented her, for he had seen on the top step of the staircase that led to the floor above a red foot followed by another, and slowly, majestically, the whole scarlet dress of Red Death met his eyes, and he once more saw the death's head of Paros Garik. It's he, he exclaimed. This time he shall not escape me. But Christian had slammed the door at the moment when Raoul was on the point of rushing out. He tried to push her aside. Whom do you mean by he, she asked in a changed voice, who shall not escape you? Raoul tried to overcome the girl's resistance by force, but she repelled him with a strength which he would not have suspected in her. He understood or thought he understood and at once lost his temper. Who, he repeated angrily, why he, the man who hides behind the hideous mask of death, the evil genius of the churchyard at Paras, red death, in a word, madam, your friend, your angel of music, but I shall snatch off his mask as I shall snatch off my own. And this time we shall look each other in the face, he and I, with no veil and no lies between us. And I shall know whom you love and who loves you. He burst into a mad laugh while Christine gave a disconsolate moan behind her velvet mask. With a tragic gesture, she flung out her two arms, which fixed a barrier of white flesh against the door. And the name of our love, Raoul, you shall not pass. He stopped. What had she said? In the name of their love? Never before had she confessed that she loved him. And yet she had had opportunities enough. 
who her only object was to gain a few seconds. She wished to give the Red Death time to escape. And in accents of childish hatred, he said, You lie, madam, for you do not love me and you have never loved me. What a poor fellow I must be to let you mock and flout me as you have done. Why did you give me every reason for hope at Paras? For honest hope, madam, for I am an honest man and I believed you to be an honest woman when your only intention was to deceive me. Alas, you have deceived us all. You have taken a shameful advantage of the candid affection of your benefactress herself, who continues to believe in your sincerity while you go about the opera ball with red death. I despise you. And he burst into tears. She allowed him to insult her. She thought of but one thing to keep him from leaving the box. You will beg my pardon one day for all those ugly words, Raoul. And when you do, I shall forgive you. He shook his head. No, no, you've driven me mad. When I think that I had only one object in life to give my name to an opera wench. Raoul, how can you? I shall die of shame. No, dear, live, said Christine's grave and changed voice. And goodbye, goodbye, Raoul. The boy stepped forward, staggering as he went. He risked one more sarcasm. Oh, you must let me come and applaud you from time to time. I shall never sing again, Raoul. Really, he replied still more satirically. So he is taking you off the stage. I congratulate you, but we shall meet in the boy one of these evenings. Not in the boy nor anywhere, Raoul. You shall not see me again. May one ask at least to what darkness you are returning. For what hell are you leaving, mysterious lady? Or for what paradise? I came to tell you, dear, but I can't tell you now. You would not believe me. You've lost faith in me, Raoul. It is finished. She spoke in such a despairing voice that she that the lad began to feel remorse for his cruelty. But look here, he cried. Can't you tell me what all this means? You are free. There is no one to interfere with you. You go about Paris. You put on a domino to come to the ball. Why do you not go home? What have you been doing this past fortnight? What is this tale about the angel of music, which you've been telling Mama Valerius? Someone may have taken you in, played upon your innocence. I was a witness of it myself at Paras, but you know what to believe now. You seem to me quite sensible, Christine. You know what you are doing. And meanwhile, Mama Valerius lies waiting for you at home and appealing to your good genius. Explain yourself, Christine, I beg of you. Anyone might have been deceived as I was. Was What is this farce? Christine simply took off her mask and said, Dear, it is a tragedy. Raoul now saw her face and could not restrain an exclamation of surprise and terror. The fresh complexion of former days was gone. A mortal pallor covered those features, which he had known so charming and so gentle, and sorrow had furrowed them with pitiless lines and traced dark and unspeakably sad shadows under her eyes. My dearest, my dearest, he moaned, holding out his arms. You promised to forgive me. Perhaps, someday, perhaps, she said, resuming her mask, and she went away, forbidding him with a gesture to follow her. He tried to disobey her, but she turned round and repeated her gesture of farewell with such authority that he dared not move a step. He watched her till she was out of sight. Then he also went down among the crowd, hardly knowing what he was doing, with throbbing temples and an aching heart. And as he crossed the dancing floor, he asked if anybody had seen Red Death. Yes, everyone had seen Red Death, but Raoul could not find him. And at two o'clock in the morning, he turned down the passage behind the scenes that led to Christine Day's dressing room. His footsteps took him to that room where he had first known suffering. He tapped at the door. There was no answer. He entered. As he had entered, when he looked everywhere for the man's voice. The room was empty. A gas jet was burning, turned down low. He saw some writing paper on a little desk. He thought of writing to Christine, but he heard steps in the passage. He had only time to hide in the inner room, which was separated from the dressing room by a curtain. Christine entered, took off her mask with a weary movement and flung it on the table. She sighed and let her pretty head fall into her two hands. What was she thinking of? Oh, Raoul? No, for Raoul heard her murmur, poor Eric. At first, he thought he must be mistaken. To begin with, he was persuaded that if anyone was to be pitied, it was he, Raoul. It would have been quite natural if she had said, poor Raoul, after what had happened between them. But shaking her head, she repeated, poor Eric. What had this Eric to do with Christine's sighs? And why was she pitying Eric when Raoul was so unhappy? 
Christine began to write deliberately, calmly, and so placidly that Raoul, who was still trembling from the effects of the tragedy that separated them, was painfully impressed. What coolness, he said to himself. She wrote on, filling two, three, four sheets. Suddenly she raised her head and hid the sheets in her bodice. She seemed to be listening. Raoul also listened. Whence came that strange sound, that distant rhythm. A faint singing seemed to issue from the walls. Yes. It was as though the walls themselves were singing. The song became plainer. The words were now distinguishable. He heard a voice, very beautiful, very soft, very captivating voice, but for all its softness, it remained a male voice. The voice came nearer and nearer. It came through the wall. It approached, and now the voice was in the room in front of Christine. Christine rose and addressed the voice as though speaking to someone. Here I am, Eric, she said. I'm ready, but you are late. Raoul, peeping from behind the curtain, could not believe his eyes, which showed him nothing. Christine's face lit up. A smile of happiness appeared upon her bloodless lips. A smile like that of sick people when they receive the first hope of recovery. The voice without a body went on singing. And certainly Raoul had never in his life heard anything more absolutely and heroically sweet, more gloriously insidious, more delicate, more powerful, in short, more irresistibly triumphant. He listened to it in a fever, and he now began to understand how Christine Day was able to appear one evening before the stupefied audience with accents of a beauty hitherto unknown, of a superhuman exultation, while doubtless still under the influence of the mysterious and invisible master. The voice was singing the wedding night song from Romeo and Juliet. Raoul saw Christine stretch out her arms to the voice as she had done in Paras churchyard to the invisible violin playing the resurrection of Lazarus, and nothing could describe the passion with which the voice sang. Fate links thee to me forever and a day. The strains went through Raoul's heart, struggling against the charm that seemed to deprive him of all his will and all his energy, and of almost all his lucidity at the moment when he needed them most. He succeeded in drawing back the curtain that hid him, and he walked to where Christine stood. She herself was moving to the back of the room, the whole wall of which was occupied by a great mirror that reflected her image, but not his, for he was just behind her and entirely covered by her. Fate links thee to me forever and a day. Christine walked toward her image in the glass, and the image came toward her. The two Christines, the real one and the reflection, ended by touching and Raoul put out his arms to clasp the two in one embrace, but by a sort of dazzling miracle that sent him staggering, Raoul suddenly flung back while an icy blast swept over his face. He saw not two, but four, eight, twenty Christine spinning round him, laughing at him and fleeing so swiftly that he could not touch one of them. At last, everything stood still again and he saw himself in the glass, but Christine had disappeared. He rushed up to the glass. He struck at the walls. Nobody. And meanwhile, the room still echoed with a distant, passionate singing. Fate links thee to me forever and a day. Which way? Which way had Christine gone? Which way would she return? Would she return? Alas, had she not declared to him that everything was finished? And was the voice not repeating, fate links thee to me forever and a day? To me? To whom? Then, worn out, beaten, empty-brained, he sat down on the chair which Christine had just left. Like her, he let his head fall into his hands. When he raised it, the tears were streaming down his young cheeks, real heavy tears like those which jealous children shed. Tears that wept for sorrow which was in no way fanciful, but which is common to all the lovers on earth, and which he expressed aloud. Who is this Eric? he said. Tomorrow, 10. Forget the name of the man's voice. It's shorter than what we just read even. So it won't take very long. I've only been live 25 minutes. So 
Um, <clears throat> there's like so little to do here. It really is. Um, a kind person would be like, wow, she must be really busy. But this is pretty much as far as it gets. So, um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to go lay down in bed in a clean bed, but still, so see ya.